Welcome to the Audible Genius Podcast, where we take a behind the scenes look at being a musician. I'm Joe Hanley, and today I'm talking to Jeff Miller, a composer and designer who's worked extensively with technology that uses music to help people sleep. We'll be talking about how to create music that connects with a listener and then guides their state of mind down a particular path. This is a fascinatingly specific journey into composing, technology, and the human psyche. Let's get started. All right, so Jeff, uh, you've done a number of things in your career that I'm, I'm really interested in. And one of the first ones I want to talk about was your work with the Sync Project, where you made the Unwind Music app. Great. Which, simply put, you know, used music to help people relax, fall asleep, that kind of thing, you know, relieve stress. Tell me, kind of, how, how did it work? Well, uh, you know, it sort of begins with the goal of uh, trying to figure out how how to use music effectively to affect people's you know physiological state, and so um, you know, there's a whole lot of thinking that went into it. So you know, we we can touch on any any aspect of that that you like, but sort of mechanically speaking, uh, it was built around this concept of generative music, which um, I know. Uh, you know, you have some familiarity with that, and I'm sure with some people in your audience do as well. Um, but you know, I'll just give a quick overview. You know, gen generative music uh, was uh, popularized by uh, Brian Eno. You know, and what it it describes is, is music that's sort of uh, ever different and and changing, and it's performed by a system. So, in 1978, you know, Brian Eno did this uh, with tape loops. You know, uh, which is you know, very analog. He had tape looping around chair legs and all kinds of crazy stuff. A bunch of uh, a bunch of very mechanical machines doing this work. Um, so we wanted to do a, a digital version of that. It's very common in gaming uh, generative music. Right. Um, but the uh, the other sort of piece of it that we wanted to add was to make it adaptive so that um, and what that means uh, is um, making it possible for the volume, the rhythm, the sample content, and basically a bunch of other parameters to change in response to specific events or inputs. And in our case, we were looking to use sensors, um, either through a phone or sensors that you would wear, so that we could perform generative music, but also respond to what was going on in your body. And wow. so that's the sort of, um, uh, that's the palette that we're working with when we created Unwind which was um, a really interesting sort of combination of, you know, uh, learning about um, how uh, all these different musical parameters might affect somebody. And I, we did a bunch of research around that, which I can talk about. Um, and then building a system that would almost, in a sense, uh, emulate the work that a music therapist would do when working with a client, mm. um, which is, you know, uh, rooted in this this idea of iso principle which you and i talked about not long ago but i can i can go into more detail around that as well um but you know in terms of uh how it worked we 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 had a system that was able to ingest a bunch of samples as opposed to um you know like more of a synthesizer or, or midi uh, type of performance we used sample based music i composed a bunch of music uh, to work with the system and then we wrote uh, a rules-based sort of um, uh, system that would allow us to define specific levels of energy within a composition and then affect through these inputs of sensors or, or actually even through just a you know, user input on the phone, um, we would understand sort of where somebody was and then perform the music over time to take them where we wanted them to go. Okay. So let me start at the core of that. What, what is the ISO principle, that music therapy principle that was all built on? Sure, yeah. So um, ISO principle is defined as, it's a, it's a technique by which music is matched to the mood of a client. This is the way uh, music therapists work. It's actually, it's at the core of music therapy. Um, so you want to you know match the mood of your client and then gradually over time modulate to affect the desired mood state. Um, so you can imagine an example where somebody comes into um, the uh, music therapist's session in a very agitated state. They're not going to 
tr- play something peaceful and mellow to try to chill them out. They're going to actually try to meet them where they are with something maybe that's a little more active or maybe has a melodic content that that they, you know, through their sort of lens of music might meet the client mood better. And then they're going to sort of, again, using their craft, modulate over time to help shift that client into a different headspace, uh, which is just a it's magical if you think about it. But yeah, that, that is why music therapy is a thing. Um, because there's, it's a, you know, there's a lot of evidence, uh, and science behind this stuff. Uh, it's fascinating. Absolutely yeah, fascinating. It really is. So, so they, they're, since they're a human talking to a human, they could just gauge using their, their instinct. And then they have maybe one or a handful of instruments that they can pick and choose to start playing yep. for them. And then they can just modify it as they go. Yeah. That's one, that's one very, um, you know, hands-on kind of way where you're, you're performing music in real time and, and often music therapists will, uh, you know, have instruments that the clients can have in the, uh, if they're capable, you know, that they can use uh, usually simple things, you know, rhythmic instruments or, okay. you know, uh, just basic instruments that anybody could play. Um, sometimes uh, therapists will will use pre-recorded music as well. It really just depends on the client and on the approach, but they're still using their, you know, okay. uh, their innate musical craft to 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 gauge, you know, what the um, what the client's state is. And so that's what we wanted to do with Unwind. We wanted to create, in this case, you know, we did it as a uh, as an iPhone app. You know, we wanted to create a, a situation where you could put this thing in the hands of anyone and get enough information about them to understand, you know, where they are in the moment and then use generative music to meet them there and then over time uh, take them somewhere. In our case, we were mostly targeting relaxation and sleep. So I, I love this process where you take something that's currently being done, you know, in real life, human beings, human to human, and then try to create this automated app version of yeah. that experience. Well, that's kind of blowing up right now, isn't it? Right. I mean, yeah. I can't open my feed without reading something about AI. And so right, right, uh, right. Uh, this was more of a machine learning model, okay. you know, that started with a with a a very logical set of rules and, and responses, but it was intended uh, to to move in the direction um, where it would, it would get better with time. And, uh, yeah, it's, it is, it's fascinating thing. I think people are of, uh, it's a polarizing idea in a lot of ways, but I will, I will say that we never set out to replace music therapists. Uh, our, our main goal was to see, you know, could we create something that would be a, a, a helpful adjunct to other types of therapies, in-person therapies, or even an adjunct to medication in some cases, because, uh, you know, uh, as Sync Project was um, kicking off uh, as a startup, opioid crisis was in was in the news every day. Okay. You know, it still should be, but it's a it's the kind of thing where um, you know the ingredients that we were using um, to create this system could have been a really meaningful adjunct to uh, other types of therapies. Yeah, and I think that's one of the big things that you know, instead of replacing a therapist you're you're giving them an additional tool in particular i think it's right because they can do it at home right the therapist can't exactly. go home with you right right so this yeah. is something you can it's like a sup, supplement to their work with you yeah and we see this more and more you know uh, as i've i've worked with a, a variety of um healthcare professionals over the years uh this idea of you know we we have a protocol uh to to um serve people, you know, in person, but boy, we, we really don't want to leave them hanging when they're on their own. People right. need more access. And so that's always been the lens that I've looked at this kind of technology through. Like if, if you can make, you know, increased access and support the goal, uh, then there really is nothing polarizing about it. It's, it's, there's always going to be a need, um, or at least as far as I can see, there's always going to be a need for, uh, human contact and, and human expertise. Um, in therapeutic environments, but, uh, people are capable of self-directing and we do it all the time. This was the other sort of insight that we had going in, uh, to this work is that, you know, we, all of us use music and movies and TV and uh, for mood regulation, we do it without even thinking about it, you know? Mm. Um, oh. and, yeah. and so, you know, if you sort of think about it through that, um, through that lens, you know, all media has potential therapeutic value. Um, so what can you do to help people help themselves? I like to think of it that way. Yeah. It sounds like by creating this very singular experience in this app, you're curating it for them. Like 
think about more of a wide environment, like say yeah. social media, that can take you any direction, a bad yeah. direction, a good direction. But that's right. This is more narrow with one specific goal in mind. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the other uh, the other application that we created, the uh, the sync music bot was a little bit more about curation because that uh, was relying on, on Spotify um, uh, streaming platforms to, to bring music um, into functional audio playlists which is a little different the stuff we did with unwind was 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 intentionally um original compositions novel music and the idea there is that um you know when you when you're familiar with a piece of music um you can anticipate where it's going and this concept of uh, anticipation can be counter to letting go in the moment and um you know allowing yourself to drift off so Having so it's 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 a it's, and it's a challenge, right? Because you you uh, on the one hand you really have to meet people's preferences. You know, some people do not want to hear acoustic guitars. Some people do not want to hear electronic music. Um, some people must hear acoustic guitars in order to relax. You know, it's a really interesting thing. So you have to provide a range, I think, of sort of styles and genres. But by by presenting music that is. Um, completely novel to that person and with generative it never plays the same way twice you're reducing this this sort of um thing that we 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 tend to do naturally which is to pay attention to the music when we learn it we learn it quickly i mean you know uh most of us you know can name a familiar song within like three seconds of hearing it you know uh and so you know if you can reduce that a little bit um through novel music um then you have that much more of a, a chance to let your body and your mind respond to those uh, aspects of the music that are designed to help you unwind. That's interesting. So if they know the song, like you said, they know where they're going, it almost sort of activates their more like the conscious front of their mind, exactly. and then, which is the opposite direction you're trying to take them. in. In that case. Yeah. Yeah. And I think okay. uh, particularly when you're aiming for sleep, you know, you want to be really mindful of that. And hmm. it's interesting, like this is, you know, this is all stuff that I've I've held on to over the years since Six Project, with Sync Project, which we we started in 2016. But these these sort of um, ingredients of um, you know mindfulness, uh, ISO principle, and then mm-hmm. uh, uh, entrainment is the other sort of um, concept that I, I carry around with me, which is you know entrainment describes the way that our our bodies gradually sync with external rhythms. Um, so. This is also, you know, again, a lot of directional evidence and studies have been done around this. But, you know, for example, um, you know, slowing your breathing rate is shown to help reduce stress. And your breathing rate actually is constantly adapting to external audio signals um, and, really? uh, and other signals as well. But uh, so in, in music for rest, you know, I use this concept to inform compositional guidelines and tempo and instrumental and rhythmic density and, and melodic motifs and repetition stuff like that. So, uh, you know, with original music developed for generative and adaptive playback, you can keep all this stuff in mind. Whereas if you just pull a track off of Spotify, um, you know, you've got to work with whatever that very, whatever that composition, um, is, you know, that's what the composer created, you know, and it's not going to change. Um, but playlisting is interesting, right? Because you get a flow between tracks that can have a very powerful effect. Um, just a different, different approach yeah so that was a, a slack bot right like you wrote like a, a an automated bot that would generate playlists for people in slack for certain purposes yep yep that's um so that was called we called it a sync music bot not a terribly clever name but uh the notion there uh again we had a pretty specific goal which was to um try to uh work with uh, a set of known musical parameters and recommendation engines in this case, we we integrated with Spotify, and we had uh, you know we had the director of research at the time uh, on our advisory board um, from Spotify, so we were able to get really mm-hmm. under the hood of how their recommendation engine works, and then um, using that sort of uh, uh, model, work within a classification system uh, that was actually for the most part driven by users. Um, so if you think about uh, playlisting and Spotify, there are millions of playlists out there that users have labeled relaxation or chill out or right. running. That was a big one. Um, 
focus. And so what you have is a massive user base of people giving you this data saying, this is what I listen to when I want to focus. This is what I want to listen to when I want to relax. This is what I want to listen to when I'm coding. This is what I want to listen to when I'm, you know, working in Adobe or drawing or whatever. There's all this information, all this data out there. So we took that sort of body of data and the insight that people sort of do this naturally. And we created a, uh, a chat bot um, that would get even more data uh, from people in terms of what they were trying to do and what kinds of music, which artists they associated with doing that thing. And so we, uh, we decided that a great place to do it would be in Slack where people are uh, working all day long and uh, where a lot of people are looking to um, they keep that open while they're, while they're doing their work. And for many of us, you know, work is, especially creative people, um, uh, work is about getting into a flow state. There's something we have in common with people who do a lot of coding. So, um, we created a, a chat bot dialogue that would, uh, is really a, a plugin for, um, for Slack that would interact with both teams and individuals. And through that, you could tell the bot what it is you were trying to do. You know, are you trying to code? Are you trying to relax? Are you trying to focus? Do you want to have a nap? Uh, and then uh, you'd give it a couple of indications of your preference, and it would build for you uh, essentially a functional playlist that would show up in Slack, and you could play it right there, whether it was uh, for a team or for an individual. Wow. And was it like the algorithm that you guys wrote for it? Was it just kind of a matter of feeding it all those playlists that already existed in Spotify? And then it kind of started to be able to think on its own in the sense that it could take all the input from that user and well, what he wanted and yep. pick and I, choose songs. I can't take any credit for any of that because I'm not an engineer or a data scientist, right. but those those folks had it working intelligently out of, out of the gate. So we weren't just pulling playlists from Spotify. We were um, adding our own sort of secret sauce to it, which was ro- rooted in, in um, uh, you know, some of those... Uh, early data insights we were able to get our hands on, but was really more about the dialogue we were having with you in Slack. And it was a very natural feeling kind of dialogue. And so the moment you gave us this idea of uh, an example input would be, I want to code to, you know, uh, Miles Davis uh, and Daft Punk. And you could give just those two sort of insights. And that would tell us like what your range of um, uh, um, sort of preference was. And, and we would, along with that, uh, then, you know, knowing what we knew about the recommendation engine under the hood, uh, we would, and, and all of the parameters within that available to us, we would sculpt a functional playlist for you that met your preferences oh, oh, oh. as well as, uh, uh, you know, took you on sort of a journey. So you could speak to the bot in plain English. Like yep. you could just say, yeah, this is what I want to do. And it would be able to parse that and figure yep. out what to do oh, yeah that cool. was that was our first sort of foray into approaching natural language processing stuff which you know again at that at that time this was around 2017 i guess now um you know chat bots were, were kind of a big deal so as a startup we were just looking for you know ways we could approach our mission which at its core was you know using um using music to, to help people um in in positive ways in more prescriptive ways um whether it was an iOS app or a chat bot didn't matter to us. What mattered was, you know, can we, can we get deeper on this? Can we, can we find more data? Can we get more right. truth around this? And can we present it to people in a way that, that feels good and, and honest and, and authentic? That's cool. Is that bot still active? Unfortunately, neither of those, uh, neither of the unwind app or the bot are still out there. The reason being, that sync project was acquired in 2018. And so along with that was our technology. Um, and it's really up to the people who acquired us, whether or not that stuff, um, is ever presented again. But, uh, well now going back to the unwind music app. So you had this idea, you wanted to take the ISO principles of music therapy. You wanted to turn it into an app form, composing music, generative music, all that. So how, how do you get, I want to talk about the music part, but how do you get to that? Like, how do you get to the point from the idea to the, okay, here's how we should structure this music. Well, it's, it's funny because uh, in my case, I really had to lean into my experience as a design, as a design professional. Everything okay, okay over there? Yeah, yeah. I trapped my, <laughs> trapped my coffee. It has a lid, thank you. Oh, me. glad to hear that. Yeah, so I, uh, um, you know, I have a, along with this 
you know, lifelong pursuit of music. I've, I've got a, a sig- significant career as a design lead in, in Boston. And um, I just, you know, relied on, on that experience mostly to figure out how, how to get from A to B. It's not intuitive. You join a, a startup like a sync project with a with a weird mission, um, mm-hmm. you know, sort of like a health adjacent mission. Uh, everybody in the company is a musician also. Uh, and uh, I, I had to think about all of the practices that I would use to, you know, design an app or, or a website or, or any kind of piece of multimedia or, or communication. And it's really just fun, foundational user experience design principles that come into play there. You have to first define, you know, who your audience is, what their pain is, what you're trying to do. And you have to speak about it in very human terms. So for me, it was actually super exciting because when we joined sync project, uh, it was like about 10 of us and we had this crazy idea for unwind. One of the people on staff was a, a, a student music therapist. Uh, we had a data scientist, a couple, a couple of data scientists, a couple of engineers, full stack engineer, iOS engineer. Uh, we had our founder who, who was, you know, uh, mainly, you know, a musician and sort of a, you know, entrepreneur and, uh, and, uh, and, a, and, a, and a, a lead technologist. And so here we are in a room with this, this idea that we all have a lot of passion around. Um, for me, it was a, a, and, oh, I'm sorry, I should, I should also say on our advisory board, not only did we have, you know, the director of um, research for Spotify, but we had, you know, people like uh, Peter Gabriel and St. Wow. Vincent uh, <laughs> and Esapeka Solomon. And, and, and it's just an incredible uh, cast of people available to us. I didn't get to spend as much uh, time with those folks as I would have liked to, but for sure uh, we had, <laughs> I can have one memorable meeting with, with Peter Gabriel uh, showing up at our offices in uh, downtown Boston. And, you know, that was an incredible moment because I'm able to do that thing that you do as a designer, where you, you, you talk about the audience you're trying to serve. You tell a story about what you want them to experience you kind of go deep on what the potential components might be of that uh, system and, and what that um, sort of interface for that might feel like. And, and then you get, then you get feedback, you know, uh, and you, you have to be able to, um, you know, as a designer, uh, I think you, the, the obligation is to sort of, regardless of the discipline of the person sitting across from you, your obligation is to take their reaction to what you're, what you're describing and, and incorporate it. You know, so it's very much a multidisciplinary, you know, cross-functional approach to this this puzzle of how do you create something that's you know uh, ostensibly going to um, you know augment or uh, in the moment a- a- anyway serve as um, you know sort of a proxy for for a therapist. Yeah, and uh, and uh, there are, there are some techniques in design that lend themselves very well to this. Um, uh, and if you have an engineer in the room, they're going to ask specific questions and then you just try to answer them together. Huh. <laughs> That's fascinating. So is that what say like Peter Gabriel and St. Vincent and Esapeka, is that kind of how you work with them where you would just talk to them, like tell them, Hey, here's the thing we're making and here's our idea of how to make it. Yeah. What do you think? Just like here with their experience would just prompt them to say like what their opinion would be of it. Yeah. And, 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 and those cases, these are f- folks who were working in a, um, an advisory way, you know, mm-hmm. they didn't need to get their hands dirty with the, um, with the technical stuff. Um, although you know, a lot of willingness to talk there and certainly, you know, um, uh, you know, so, so someone like Peter Gabriel, I mean, I, I'll be honest. And there's a picture of me on my website like, with my arm around him and then the whole, the whole team is there. And I'm, I'm just kind of blown out at the in the moment as I'm I'm there because I mean my God if anybody understands emotions and music and and it's it's him, you know, uh, but yeah, the, it, mostly it was just sort of like hey here's what we think we're doing, you know, Mr. Gabriel and and uh, <laughs> and he's like oh that's that's interesting here's you know here are some questions I have and and here are some thoughts you know and uh, huh. with with him I won't I won't I won't quote him because I would hate to risk such a thing but I, my sure. my takeaway from it. Uh, is that his concerns were primarily very human, you know, and okay. and very much like he was very interested in bringing it back to what is going to resonate with a with a human being, um, which you know just tells you what kind of person he is. I think. Yeah, yeah, it explains why his music is so uh, powerful. You know, it yeah. resonates <laughs> with people. Right? I guess that's Absolutely. where his mind is. Yeah. Okay. 
so then you 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 go through these different processes you get this strong idea of how you want to create this music so now like you said you're using samples you were composing some music and this is all being incorporated into a generative engine so how does it work exactly um is there say a library of samples or like chunks of music you've composed that it's piecing together in real time is that yeah uh, well to to um to answer that question i might have to you know back up into a, some some uh conceptual stuff a little so uh from from a from a compositional perspective you know i'm just I'm just working in, in, uh, I use reason a lot. I use pro tools, you know, just okay. like uh, you pick your day, DAW, you know, I might be working with acoustic instruments. I might be working with electronic instruments. In this case, I was working with all of them, but, um, it's all, it's much, uh, it's really all about intentionality, um, as well as, as expression. So, you know, uh, I would structure these compositions so that they could modulate and so you have to you have to make some assumptions that are somewhat universal when you're doing that so when i talk about iso principle and meeting people where they are in my uh, i had i had to have a mental model in place where you know uh i'm i'm people are are listening to this stuff on purpose because you know we've said that we can help you go from uh, a, a space where maybe you're struggling to fall asleep which which might be as a result of stress or racing mind. And we're going to, we're going to help you come to a place where you can rest. And so I have to make some assumptions up front that, you know, you maybe are uh, a little bit more awake or a little bit more agitated or, you know, you're for whatever reason, you know, you've, you've chosen to, to do this listening. And so um, that's my sort of starting point from a, from a compositional perspective. I'm coming at it from the place of let's assume that the, not everybody is showing up to this uh, in a relaxed way, ready to fall asleep. Some people are going to need uh, a little more uh, distraction, a little more engagement. Okay. And so uh, here's here's like the basic recipe that I keep in my mind, which is especially for 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 music for rest. Um, there's this notion of uh, moving from a high density of layers to a minimal density of layers moving from uh, a high beat salience to zero or very low and steady beat salience moving from easy pattern recognition to no pattern recognition or chord changes to no chord changes active melodic motion or broad melodic range to sparse melody or, or melodic range and so a lot of times i would compose things in sort of like either a ramp you could all, you could actually look at my Pro Tools or my Reason file, and you would see just the layers going down to nothing from like ten to zero, okay. uh, and you, you could see the uh, you know the the uh, the MIDI data. You know, very dense over here, and almost just a bunch of you know big long drones over here. Or sometimes I would almost I would compose them as more like a like a like a triangle going from you know zero to uh, or like a pyramid, like from zero to a, to a peak, okay. and then back down again. And from all of that, from all those different layers. Um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a lot of stuff that I think would be familiar to anyone who works with a DAW. You've got uh, a choice. You can, you can uh, uh, export stems, which is what I think a lot of, uh, generative game engines, uh, use, or, you know, what we did is we got a little more atomic than that. Uh, I, I would get down to sort of, uh, I've got these instrument lanes and within these instrument lanes, I've got a variety of motifs that are uh, living in there and I'm going to slice those up. And so we had a beat model on the other end uh, where we could um, pull those samples in and tell them sort of when and where to show up. But we would use this concept of generative music and adaptability to say, well, you know, if we think you're sort of somebody who's, you know, at a, let's say there's a, a like a low, medium, high range of um, uh, arousal state. Um, if we think you're highly aroused, you know, we might start off with more energy and then, uh, over 10 or 15 minutes, start to wind that down. If we think that you've sort of shown up in more of a medium arousal state, we'll start you there and bring you down, you know? So okay. it's a, it's an interesting thing when you, when you think about, you know, meeting people where they are, you know, the more you, the more aroused you are and, and by aroused, you know, I mean, 
you know, the more sort of awake you are, um, the more, um, you know, uh, or the less sleepy you are is another way to, 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 to say the same thing. Or, you know, just uh, in general, you know, how are you showing up with, with sort of um, uh, the, the a need for help? You, you're, I'm sorry. Uh, let me go back on this. Your, your, your mood or your um, arousal state, you could think of it as your, how you perceive your, your, your uh, state of wakefulness or your stress level or your awareness of stress or even mental or physical energy, right? Uh, if you think of that as a continuum from, uh, uh, low medi- to, from low to medium to high, and then you, you try to match that with this idea of pattern recognition or you know, active chord changes or active melodic motion, uh, that's the craft of it is, is thinking compositionally how to, you know, take the music that you're making and map it to that continuum and then slice it up, tell a system when to play what. Now, a quick word for our listeners. Jeff is talking about composing music in the DAW, which is essentially music recording software. This is how so much music is created nowadays, not just for sleep purposes, but for any reason you can imagine. If this is something you want to do, I highly recommend our super effective course, Building Blocks. It'll take you step by step through the process of writing the building blocks of beats, like drum patterns, bass lines, chord progressions, and melodies. And it all takes place in an actual online DAW where you create music as you go. And for our loyal podcast listeners, you can get 20% off Building Blocks this month using coupon code SLEEP. Check it out at audiblegenius.com. Yeah, that, that <laughs> fascinates me on so many levels. One thing I loved was how you, you, know, you intentionally create music that's active, whether it's like you said, the, the beat's real salient or the, the melody's dense, the chords are changing a lot on purpose just to get their attention. You know, like kind of the way yeah. yep. you have to get like, I, like if I need my kid to stop screaming around the house, I have to get his attention first. And then I have to calm them down. And it's that same idea. Right? I, I think that's the, that's the amazing part of it. Um, because, you know, like any of us, we can, I could go uh, onto Spotify or YouTube right now and I can find something mellow that's, you know, uh, that I think will pull me in the right direction if what I want is to relax. But it's amazing to think that, um, you know, there's technology uh, that can, you know, actually sort of steer your mood over time, make it easier for you to acclimate. Yeah, you know, this is this is one of the reasons I started the podcast that I have too, is because a lot of times, you know, uh, if you go and look for um, content that's going to help you sleep, you'll find a lot of stuff that just it just immediately starts in that very sleepy space. You'll you'll find a sleep story or something, and it's like you're supposed to go from sixty miles an hour. Like I've been doing things all day. I'm very busy. My my head has just hit the pillow, and suddenly you're saying in a very sleepy voice follow me into storyland. I can't do that. Like I'm, I'm not ready yet. Or like I, I, I personally, you know, I have a meditation practice. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very comfortable, um, with mindfulness practice, but, um, when I get into bed, like in that moment, I'm not necessarily ready to, um, you know, to start doing a, a deep breathing exercise and and in fact, you know, in a lot of ways, meditation is is an invitation to be awake. You know, it's about present moment awareness. It's not so much about drifting off. So, you know, this was it's all this sort of um, uh, things that are intuitive. You know, that that would help you relax. But at the same time, I think people do appreciate if you can meet them where they are and then move towards a space as opposed to just dropping them. You know, right into the yeah, absolutely right into the water. As it so were. you. So you compose all these tracks of different levels of activity, I guess we could say, and all those different elements you mentioned, and you feed them to the engine. And are you literally having to kind of like tell the engine, okay, this is this is active, this is less active, like almost kind of rate the activity of each musical chunk yep. in a sense? Okay. Yeah, that's where we started. Um, and again, I can't take credit for how the system ultimately performed, mm-hmm. and it, ultimately it did perform quite well. Um, but... Uh, I start off with something that is composed in a static environment. Uh, and then we, we wrote what I think of as sort of rule sets around, you know, this is what, these are the ingredients that are allowed in a high energy mode. These are the ingredients that are allowed in a medium energy okay. mode. Okay. These are the ingredients allowed. And 
in a, in a low energy mode. And that, that might also include some uh, instructions around tempo. Um, some of that might have been baked into the compositions themselves or the samples themselves. But um, the idea and the way that it was constructed was that we, we would, you know, um, first feed it through sort of like this um, logic-based, rules-based mechanism. Uh, and then uh, the machine learning would take over. Got it. And when you say these are the ingredients, how granular did that get? Like, were you telling the thing like, hey, when the melody is playing this many notes or that kind of thing? Or was it more like these clips are? I, I, I just for sanity's sake, I, I had like a, um, you know, uh, a limited number of instrument lanes. I think the probably the busiest one was like 12. And within any instrument lane, I might have had like 10 or 20 different clips. Okay. A different. And then uh, and so but they were designed compositionally in such a way that uh, I knew I knew which clips had more um, active melodic pieces. So like I'll say it's a guitar lane. I, I knew which okay. one had like the sort of busier guitar licks and which one had the more sort of spacey guitar licks. And I and I could um, sort of target those not only just as clips, but in terms of like um, uh, repetition or frequency or variety even. So when I'm composing this stuff, this is the kinds of things I'm thinking about. Like, is this a, is this a melodic motif that I will want to have repeat frequently? How many variations of this motif do I want? Okay. Um, and then uh, it's easy enough after that, because of the geniuses I was working with to sort of tell the system, like, this is what I was thinking. Uh, that's cool. Yeah. That's very cool. I mean, there's no GUI for it at that level. Uh -huh. um, you know, this was, this was me sitting next to a, uh, uh, a very wise uh, and uh, experienced data scientist and, and, okay. a, and a couple of engineers who, thank God, you know, we all could talk about music together. You know, we had that common language. So as we're staring at these, you know, lines of code, we're also, you know, talking about, you know, things like melody and harmony and, and intended rhythm and stuff. And we, we could do that. If I hadn't been working with musicians, I would have been up a creek. <laughs> Oh yeah, can you imagine? Yeah, they, they. I would imagine they would need to have both a code brain and a music brain, yeah. so they knew how to connect them, and then you, yeah. you guided them and how to connect them. Right? Is that kind of how it went? Absolutely, and well, and the, uh, and it was through the design sort of methodology too. You know, um, that we that we not only were able to leverage that common language, but apply it to you know building this incredible piece of technology. Um, but it's it's interesting, you know, in my experience. I've worked with a great many engineers and designers and technology folks who who are also musicians. There's it's just it's, maybe it's a Boston thing. I don't know. I see it everywhere though. Yeah, actually, a friend of mine who he was he worked in sales uh, for a long, long time. He's like, you know, what? I want to become a coder. Yeah. He lived in New York and he went to this like really good coding school called Flatiron School. Only like two percent of people get in. And after he got in, and the owner said to him, he's like, we look for people with music experience. We just find there's something like. I don't know. Some about their brains, they could just connect the dots like easier or faster, and they're more malleable in some way. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think there's there's directional evidence that you know linking you know, sort of neuroplasticity and creativity and and music together. These, it's a. Uh, I don't know. I don't like to you know uh, think about it too much. Like it's a superpower. I like to think that actually. Um, Anybody could be musical. Anybody, given the time, you know, uh, like any other craft, they could find their way to it. Um, I just know that it has helped me. I don't think I would have had a successful design career if I hadn't first spent, you know, my 10,000 hours as a musician. You know, I didn't go to school for design, but nonetheless, you know, I've been working in that field for over 25 years um, with fairly massive teams and some very well-known uh, established brands. It's just, uh, and all of that is on the back of me being a, a musician and a, and a band leader. That's very cool. Now with all these different instrument lanes with all the different clips in them, were they all interchangeable? Like, could you say combine a clip from instrument lane one with any clip from instrument lane three? Like, could they all be swapped in that sense? Yeah, it was very much uh, an exercise in intentional arranging, you know? Um, okay. So again, getting back to this idea of intentionality, you know, we, we had to create a system where we could, from a, from a very literal kind of rules-based approach, say, um, you know, if we're targeting sort of like a, a medium state 
and it was actually a little more granular than that. I'm, I'm kind of making it simple, just simpler, just for the discussion. Sure. But, you know, um, if, if we've started you off at level three and we're working towards level one, well, when we get to two, this is kind of what we think the arrangement should be. And then, uh, within that system, we also had probability. So it wasn't just a matter of what's the probability of an individual clip in an individual lane. It was what's the probability of these two lanes interacting with each other. What's the probability of these two lanes interacting with each other? Because ultimately the machine has to have some oh. freedom, you know, to say, I'm going to render this performance now. Uh, and I'm going to, I have choices. I have probability on, on my side. So, wow. yeah, that's cool. It's a trip. It's really yeah. wild to approach your music, you know, just, just to be sitting down with a blank canvas in front of you, like you always do. Right. And then, these are the things you're thinking about. It's no longer static. It's not going to be played the same way every time. And so suddenly, you know, that, that, uh, that shifts how you, you think about your intentionality. You yeah. Know, it's, it's, I bet with that different end goal in mind, how much of it was just, uh, for you when you're composing this, how much for you was it just kind of instinct, like just feel versus how much like thought, like hmm, this might be active enough or this might not be that kind of thing. Well, um, yeah, I think that's the craft. That's what a music therapist does. I'm not a music therapist, but, yeah. um, you know, uh, I'm a, I am a student of jazz. It's a, it's a improvisational sort of instinct that kicks in. Right. And, and here's the thing. It's like, there was never any attention intention to write the one piece of music that was going to work for everybody forever. It, it was sort of a known thing. You know, we're going to have to compose dozens of pieces. We're going to have to, you know, ultimately what we're, what we were trying to do was build a platform that, that many artists could contribute to. And, you know, over time people would use the system and it would get smarter. And it, more importantly, I think it would get smarter in service of an individual, you know, because your individual needs and preferences are not static either. They change over time. Um, it's, uh, but, but for me, it was, uh, very much instinct based. Um, and I could, uh, I, I think I was uh, along along with um, thinking of things like uh, d rhythmic density or, you know, uh, you know, how many layers do I have going? One of the other factors that was really top of mind for me in these compositions was this idea of valence, which is uh, another term that you know I wasn't even aware of until I started digging under the hood of Spotify to see how their recommendation engine works, but. Um, Valence describes the the musical positiveness that a track conveys. So tracks with a high valence sound more happy and cheerful, euphoric, and tracks with a low valence sound more negative, sad, depressed, angry. Huh. So um, that was a, that was really mostly what I was uh, focused on with these compositions. And I would, you know, I gave myself sort of like a baseline set of tempos. You know, I didn't really want to do anything too up tempo most of the time. It is intended to be relaxing music ultimately. Sure. Uh, dramatic shifts aren't aren't good to uh, to promote sleep. But um, with my music, I'm typically thinking modally. So, you know, I like to talk about the Lydian mode because it's a basically it's a major scale, right? Which most people associate with with happy music or or resolved sounding things. But of course you've got that raised fourth, which to me introduces tension and uncertainty. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's what I think of as sort of like a Lydian. I think of that as sort of a, a liminal mode. Uh, and, and so it, I personally find it's very beautiful. Um, uh, and since it, the goal is to meet people where they are, I don't, I don't shy away from Lydian mode or, or something more minor sounding like Dorian, which, which also has that sort of, you know, liminality built into it um, with the natural six. Uh, I'm just careful about how much tension I allow for within that. And I'm mindful about modulating in a direction that reduces harmonic tension uh, over time. Um, interestingly, too, it's, you know, it's shown that music with a low valence is actually shown to promote rest in many people. So, you know, this is this is. I think fascinating, you know, maybe this is why we love to listen to dark side of the moon. It's, <laughs> it's, it's not always about, you know, like, uh, 
you know, happy rainbows and sunshine when you're trying to relax. It's very often like a, something rooted in just minor pentatonic is, is going to have that physiological effect of chilling people out. It's, it's, it's remarkable. So with those unexpected scale degrees, right, like the Lydians raised fourth, everyone's kind of expecting that regular fourth, even if they know theory or not. They just heard the major scale a million times. Yep. So that raised fourth is just like, huh? Is yeah. that is that sort of uh, one way you're kind of trying to fight and not fight, but res uh, remove anticipation? Those little unexpected things that kind of keep just sort of rocking their boat a little bit? It you Well, that's I think you're making my point in that that is the choice we have as as. Uh, as musicians, right? We have a lot of choices available to us. You know, even Western music, we've got 12, 12 notes uh, that can be combined in any kind of way. Um, but that's where craft comes in. And it's where I think, you know, this is the value of, you know, really developing yourself as an artist uh, and developing um, not only uh, your, your sort of empathy engine, right? Which is, I think, super important. Um, but your sort of uh, your 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 ability to to intentionally go for things, you know, I think about like this is just what this is what great songwriters do. You know, you listen to Peter Gabriel's "So" or Michael Hedges' "Aerial Boundaries" or any soundtrack by Hans Zimmer or uh, Hans Zimmer or, or or Michael Giacchino. You know, these whether it's vocal or instrumental, there's an incredible amount of intentionality in that writing. Mm. In the moment, you know, what is the scene that is happening? What is the what is the picture I'm trying to to create? Um, you know, Hedges did it with just an acoustic guitar, but it's it's remarkable. You know, he has a song called "Because It's There," and it uh, you you can you're just completely transported. Um, and it's a uh, I think that is the power of music is to transport people, just like storytelling. Mm -hmm. You know, so those are the those are the choices. Uh, Will I, will I, um, will I use, uh, in this composition, will I, will I use the, the tension, um, of that sharp four to grab your sort of head in the moment and take it out of the rumination that you might be engaged in? Sure. Yeah, I might do that. I also might, you know, you know, place it, um, in a different register as part of a melody just to add a sense of wonder because it can also do that. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. You take a, a major seven chord with with that um, note floating on top of it. I mean, it is magic. Right. Um, <laughs> so it's a really interesting con context is everything. Um, but these, this is why, you know, we, when I think of this kind of work, um, I think it's very artist driven. It's very art driven. Uh, and uh, it's sort of but once you've decided, you know, uh, as an artist, you're going to you're going to. Uh, you know, especially if you're if if it was in a context like this where you're, you know, perhaps being presented as something that might have um, uh, health and wellness benefits, you know, just be very intentional. Try try your hardest to um, be open to the idea uh, of the context of the person you're 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 writing for. They're they've just stopped their busy day, you know. They're uh, for the first time in their day they've. Uh, stopped doing and uh, they're trying to move from that doing and thinking space to a just a space of being and that those transitions are very special moments yeah. they're 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 almost sacred um i had a you know uh, i think and I, I used this word earlier and it kind of flew by but this this that moment between you know um trying to sleep and actually being asleep, you can think of this as a, as a liminal state, which is that word liminal comes from uh, Latin word limen, which means threshold. And those are the spaces where change is the only thing that is actually happening. You know, it's the, that transition between what is and, and what will be. And, uh, you know, we can think of those as physical spaces. And, and we often talk about mental states as spaces or places, but like, in the physical world, there are things like, you know, stairways or hallways or doorways. Um, uh, they're emotionally, it's kind of like life transitions or milestones or, you know, things that create uncertainty. Uh, these these liminal spaces can feel uncertain. If you've ever walked down like a, a, a long, empty hallway or an empty, dark stairwell, you, you know, you know what I'm saying. 
Uh, and we don't, we don't like uncertainty and a lot of stress sort of manifests as a result of uncertainty. Um, and so you get to this emotional liminality uh, when you are laying down for the first time and everything's quiet for the first time in your day. Um, and, uh, you know, there's also evidence that liminal states are linked to creativity. And so our, our minds can get into this kind of a hyper reality where we're trying to make sense of the uncertainty in our lives. And sometimes that manifests as art, like songs and books and poetry, but it can also manifest as you lying in bed, staring at your ceiling for seven hours. You know, um, this transition from the waking or doing to the resting and being uh, rumination can kick in. And so if you're an artist and you're approaching this kind of idea, that's what you're trying to honor. I think is that liminal space. That's yeah. how I think of it anyway. Yeah, no, and I, I never heard that word before, but I love it because I myself meditate. I do a form yeah. of meditation called TM and it's sure. it's pretty yeah. much all about that, getting you, taking you to that and passing you through it. Yep. And so when I sit there and I feel it, you know, back in the day, it would have felt like, ah, it was almost unnerving that feeling because you're really letting yeah. go. Like you're making yourself vulnerable. And you're just like giving into your physiology, letting it do whatever it wants to do. Yeah. Um, but it's once you like really lean into it, it is amazing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, yeah. And I, I actually changing the subject a bit, your, your podcast sleep fader, yeah. um, which is a podcast all about helping people relax. And I was listening to an episode last week and I started to feel that I, you know, and I, I, I didn't even have the intention of relaxing or sleeping. I was, you know, I was like, I'm going to listen to this podcast. I'm interviewing Jeff next week. I want to check this out. I'm sitting at my desk working and I'm just listening to it. And all of a sudden I didn't take long. Uh, cause you started out, you talked a little bit and then you played this music. You're just like, Hey, listen to this music for a bit. <laughs> and I'm just doing that. And all of a sudden I was like, Oh, like I started to feel that liminal that I get with meditation. Wonderful. It just did it to me. I wasn't even, I didn't have the goal or anything like that. It, it just did it to me. And I noticed in that music, what you were talking about, you were, I was paying attention to how the tracks were coming and going. I was, it was, I think it started with one or two things and you added some, and then again, it started to take those yeah. tracks away well i'm very happy to hear that and thank you for checking it out i mean yeah. uh it is the podcast is a manifestation of all this work that I've, I've done over the last seven years you know not not knowing where that work may take me next um a podcast is a is a wonderful um vehicle to sort of br bring all this experience together in a, in a place where um you know i can really be super intentional in any way that I want, you know? And so right. for, for me, uh, that is, it comes back to those core ingredients. You know, I'm thinking about mindfulness and the effect it's had on my life and my ability to cope with stress and the sort of the fact that, you know, by definition, mindfulness is, is, uh, awareness that arises through paying attention on purpose, you know? So what am I going to give you, uh, to pay attention to on purpose, you know? Um, well, I'm going to, I'm going to give you, in this case, I'm going to, I'm going to give you music and I'm going to give you storytelling. These are the things that, uh, I think are, uh, have been shown, uh, for eons to help people move from one state of mind to another. Um, but what I'm going to do is, uh, think about things too, like ISO principle and entrainment. And I'm going to think about all this uh, stuff we've been talking about in terms of choices we make, uh, with, with, uh, with, uh, music and sound. And, uh, I'm going to, apply this recipe uh, to a, a format that anybody can access from anywhere. And hopefully before they get to the end of the story, they're out. <laughs> yeah. I, I started, I, so yeah, it was your introduction, music story. And then it was like a calming sound at the end. I think in this case it was waves, you know, like, like yeah. ocean sounds. And I found myself halfway through the story. I was paying attention to the story. And then when I'm realizing it again, this reminded me of meditation. I, I wasn't, I was just like off. And just like so relaxed, just sort of sitting back in my chair. And it was a couple of minutes there. I was like, oh, wait, I'm not I'm not listening to the story anymore. Is that kind of the goal? Like you want them at some point to find themselves just off in their own world, in a sense? Absolutely. Um, it, it's a uh, it's funny because I've always wanted to be a novelist uh, it, as much as I wanted to be Eddie Van Halen or, or Michael Hedges. <laughs> I wanted to be Stephen King. I just I just I guess I'm an escapist of some sort. but. Um, the storytelling piece of it, uh, you know, as as a th applications like uh, Headspace and Calm have been bringing sleep stories into the mainstream, 
um, my observation is that a lot of these were self-contained kind of one-offs. Um, and, and again, they, like, uh, they wanted to bring you very quickly into that sleepy space. The sleepy sort of fake sleepy voice starts immediately. Right. Uh, and this is not, uh, to, to disparage either of those, um, applications. I actually use both. And I think there's amazing, uh, benefits to using them. But, uh, for me personally, I was very interested in this idea of, you know, could I use a podcast format, uh, to help people sleep, uh, to practice telling a story that was more serialized, uh, which is, you know, people love to, to, to binge, um, uh, serialized stories. So I wanted to give people something to look forward to. And could I write it in such a way where it really doesn't matter if you, if you finish the story or not, you okay. know, if you listen to episode one and you don't make it to the end, can you listen to episode two and still feel like comfortable? Like you haven't missed anything. Right. So that's been an interesting exercise. I don't know if I'm succeeding on that front yet. I'm waiting for people to tell me. Uh, some people have told me they will actually, you know, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll listen to the first, uh, uh, first couple of parts of the podcast and then they'll, they won't make it to the end of the story. And so the next night they'll, they'll go back like halfway and then uh, listen through to the next episode. Okay. I, I think these are the things I can't control. And I'm just, you know, I'm so grateful anytime I get any kind of uh, feedback from folks in terms of this, but it is structured very intentionally as a three act thing. Act one is I've got like the same ambient environment. Every time I call it the studio lounge, this is just me talking in almost like a very natural non-sleepy way. Uh, it's conversational. And then within that that first act, I will always play um, a piece of music that I've created. And I'll talk, I'll sort of try to give you some present aware, uh, present moment, moment, present moment awareness, cultivating um, mindfulness cues. That's usually about five or six minutes. Uh, and then act two is going into the actual story itself, which is, you know, it's original. I write it all. It's episodic. So, it, you know, it plays out over, over, different episodes. And within the story, I try to include not mindfulness practices, but I think of them more as sort of mindful moments um, where, you know, uh, you're, you're in a sense invited to inhabit what the character is experiencing. Um, and I, and I write these very, you know, purposefully to, 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 uh, you know, give, give your mind an opportunity, not only to follow, follow a story, but to, observe and appreciate and maybe within that find some sense of gratitude you know i try to explore themes that, that people can relate to and um and there's always uh in within the story uh, musical interludes too which is it's a common practice you'll hear it in some of the best um uh uh, uh you know, <coughs> public radio pod podcasts it's a, it's a great storytelling device right to, for transitional moments to use music I'm, I'm being very deliberate about the music, um, as, as we've been discussing. So, you know, from act one, where I'll start with something that's meant to engage and, and, and sort of, you know, uh, pull your mind uh, away from your, your busy day and, and any rumination you might be engaged with. Uh, I'll use some of those same ingredients in act two, but likely I'm going to reduce some of those layers. I'm going to reduce okay. some of that beat salient salience that we talked about. I'm going to mm -hmm. reduce the melodic range and then act three. So the, after the story's done, this is usually about 20 minutes or 25 minutes in it's just down to ambient environment um, so wherever the story leaves you whether it's by a waterfall or in a rainy city or wherever you are that's where you're going to stay and my voice of course is modulating over time uh, so that uh, by the time you get to the end of the story I've probably slowed down my pace a little bit you might not even notice when I stop talking uh, and the reason I have a big long uh, usually five or ten minutes of ambient sound at the end uh, is because you don't want to make any abrupt changes with audio, whether it's in somebody's ears or in a, a, a speaker next to them. Uh, this is uh, something I learned um, both at Sync Project and when I when I worked with with Bose on their sleep products. Um, the uh, the notion is a, a good steady signal. Something like rain uh, is a great example because uh, it, it, it's it's kind of like white noise. You just let that go without a lot of modulation, without a lot of dynamics, and then just give it a nice long fade out. You, you, I've reduced the chance of waking you up. So, oh a, right, yeah, okay. Because it's very easy to create a waking event. Like if I let two or three minutes go by and then suddenly started talking again, I can guarantee it's going to wake you up. And that happens to me all the time on, when I'm listening to podcasts myself. If I if I forget to hit that little button in the lower right hand corner that says, you know, at the end of this episode, stop. 
it'll start up the next one. And next thing you know, I'm, I'm listening to ads or something. Oh, God. Something <laughs> right, right, right. And that's the other thing too. Is Sleep Fader has no ads. Like, uh, okay. maybe someday I'll be lucky enough to have sponsors, but this thing is brand new. And, uh, uh, as you know, uh, the, the business of podcasting is, a um, uh, you know, it, it can go in, uh, many directions for me. This is, so far been purely an exercise in taking what I've learned over the last seven years, trying to put it together in a package that I feel will be effective to really help people relax. And it's a, it's just a great creative uh, project for me. That's cool. So the, the music during the stories, the interludes, they're, that's almost more of like a subliminal reduction. And yeah. Downplay, Cause the focus is more on the story, but the music is progressing from the intro activity activity to the most calm, just wave sounds or something like that at the end. Yeah. Yeah. And, huh. uh, it's, uh, you know, those same principles, uh, that we talked about for music in terms of, um, you know, the perceived energy, you know, which could be a combination of, you know, layers or just uh, dynamic ingredients or just uh, any kind of active motion within a track. You know, I apply that same kind of thinking to the sound design too. So you'll, if you listen to the, uh, the podcast, you know, in, in that lounge area, I'm talking about, you know, there's some, there's some birds chirping. Sometimes there's like, you know, very quiet wind chimes playing in the background. Um, you might hear some ocean sounds. It's generally speaking, I'm trying to create a somewhat noticeable okay. environment because I'm, again, I'm trying to like pull you out of whatever headspace might be distracting you from sleep into something else. Um, and within the storytelling, you're, you're going to hear very little um, dis um, uh, distracting audio because I'm trying to modulate in that direction of uh, relaxation. Uh, so whether it's with uh, the musical sounds or with the ambient sounds, I'm very deliberately creating like a ramp down. That's the best okay. way I can meet a general audience of people sort of where they are and, and pull them in, in a, in a, in the direction of rest. Cause you don't have, you don't exactly know where the listener's state is at that point, but with the unwind app, you were using biometrics to actually measure where they were like like say their pulse like was that a big one like their heart rate yeah we we would use um in their in our prototype actually which was a it was actually a web app we used nothing more than the than the accelerometer and the phone so um and you can see some of this on my website as well but the uh um you would you would be able to uh just hold the phone in your hand um and we would get your uh heart rate from that and uh use that as your starting point for um what we delivered yeah. and uh you know the uh unwind itself we actually had a couple of user inputs too where they were just simple sliders you could say you know okay how how tired are you you know zero to ten how um how stressed are you zero to ten that type of thing uh and we could use that as an indicator as well i've always you know felt that um the sensor piece and and paying attention to uh, heart rate variability or, or respiration uh, are very powerful, um, I think, ways to uh, inform any kind of uh, audio-based therapeutic. But uh, there's no substitute when you're when you're really trying to make a machine smarter. There's no substitute for getting a dialogue going with the person. Just tell me how you feel, and then ideally later on you'd ask them, "How did that work out for you?" Really? Because I think you need I, I think you need both these things until you've got a super smart machine. It's a uh, Artificial intelligence and uh, um, machine learning—they don't happen overnight. You know, you you really do have to feed them data to make them to make them smart. And and in the case where you're you're talking about uh, individual preference, it becomes even more important. So, my uh, my hope is that as as these technologies uh, are continue to be developed and um, th these the types of therapeutics are more widely adopted, is that uh, is that um, we that the folks making them consider the importance of that dialogue people want it anyway i mean i, I that we discovered that in research that we did as well which is that um oh. you know you give people um too many choices that can be paralyzing uh that even the idea of just you know even though like i said earlier you know we all we all use music for mood regulation without even thinking about it all the time the moment you sort of change the context and put it in an app or in a machine next to your bed or something it's new. It's still new. This idea of, Hey, uh, here's a product or a service. And you know, if you listen to it on purpose, it's going to help you. People want the dialogue. They want to actually feel like you're, 
you're attending to them and and recognizing them for who they are. It's uh-huh. a, it feels good. It creates comfort. Yeah. So so the dialogue has two purposes. Then one, it's it's also kind of feeding data because because the biometrics alone aren't going to cut it. That they're part of the story, but they need to actually know what you're thinking. And together, it does a good job of generating the right kind of music. But it's also just the user experience to make them consciously feel like they're being heard. Yeah. This is. Yeah, and it's about uh, it's a big part of mindfulness and uh, possibly TM too. But it's a uh, this this idea of of intentionality comes back. You know, you're setting an intention, um, and so you can take the um, that moment of interacting with an app or, or a machine sitting on the side of your bed, um, that can be a mindful moment that enhances the experience. It's just, you're, 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 you've stopped doing the other stuff you were doing and now you're doing this. It's, I think this is the reason why vinyl never went away. Really. I think that we ultimately love the intentionality of it. We can't just, you know, hit a button and let it play in the background. You have to open up the dust jacket and pull the thing out and you have to be careful with it and put it on the turntable. And you've got to, you know, make sure that you're not just, you know, dropping the needle randomly on the thing. It's, it's a mindful act. It makes us feel good. That's a good analogy because not now I know what you're, I kind of know what you're communicating because there is that feeling that when you have to actually set the music up, even set the mechanical process in place, that you're part of it all of a sudden, you know, it's not just this thing being passively sent at you from your phone. It's a thing you are involved in. Yeah. If I walk across my studio here, I, you know, I'm, I have to, and I want to listen to music. I might know what I want to hear before I, I approach my record collection, but a lot of the time there's a little bit of flipping through the spines, you know, even though I've been looking at them for years and I have a bunch of new ones in the mix too. It's like, it's a, it's a, that tactile moment of touching the records, looking at the spines, thinking about, you're actually thinking about what, how it might make you feel. You're thinking, how could this affect me in the moment? And so as a designer and when i when i think about these kinds of experiences i love the notion of um engaging that part of a person you know like it, it just it's going to take them out of whatever they're worrying about whatever stresses they have and it, and it's going to sort of almost force them to think about how they feel and how they want to feel and if and if you can do that i mean the sensors can they can make things more comfortable like if you're trying to create like a uh, if you're trying to create something that's really going to change the way someone's breathing, for example, like you want to, you want to make sure that you're not doing something that's too fast or too slow. That could be really uncomfortable. The sensors can help with that, but ultimately, you know, uh, giving the person uh, an opportunity to engage with the moment is what it's all about. And I mean, isn't that what music is? Absolutely. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Well, Jeff, this has been really fascinating. And there's other things that you've done. What is your website again? Uh, well, the Sleep Fader website is sleepfader.com, and that is where you can find all the information about the podcast and connect to that, and, and I hope folks will give it a try. And anybody who does, please know that I will welcome any feedback uh, uh, that you've got. Uh, and my personal website is jmcreative.com. That's just my professional site where I, I highlight some stories about my uh, my work as a designer, and in this case, I'm, I've focused quite a bit of it on uh, my recent work over the last seven years or so. Yeah, well, it's all very fascinating. I, I recommend your podcast because it really unwinded me. Or that's unwind. <laughs> your sleep it helped me calm down. And yeah, it just you've just found yourself a really fascinating niche in the music technology world, and uh, it's it's just fascinating to hear about. Well, thanks so much. I'm I'm really grateful uh, for a chance to talk about it with you. And you know, uh, the tools that you've you've produced as well uh, have been super helpful in my life. I've uh, Without Centorial, I would know nothing about all the knobs and buttons sitting next to me. And, and now I know quite a bit, and it helps me uh, do a lot of the sound design that that happens in Sleep Fader. So super grateful for uh, for your work as well. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Audible Genius Podcast. Now, as you listen to these musicians' stories, you may find yourself wanting to make your own music. Or maybe you already can, but you feel the need to brush up on fundamentals, fill in some gaps. Well, I've got some super effective and engaging courses that help aspiring digital musicians find their voice and create music they love. And these courses are more than just a series of videos. They have interactive challenges in a music software environment where you actually create music as you go and get real experience. The first course I recommend is Building Blocks, where you'll learn beat composition and music theory in an online music studio. Check it out at audiblegenius.com. We also have Centorial, an award-winning course on synthesis, where you'll learn how to create your own sounds with a synthesizer. 
Check that out at centorial.com. And both of these courses are designed by yours truly and the team here at Audible Genius. So if you've ever had a desire to make your own music, I highly encourage you to check them out. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you on the next episode. Mm -hmm.